This week, we're reading Out of Little House on the Prairie, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder and published in 1935. Our first reading comes from Chapter 5, titled House on the Prairie, and it talks about how Pa constructed the family home from logs from the surrounding area. All by himself, he built the house three logs high. Then Ma helped him. Pa lifted one end of a log onto the wall. Then Ma held it while he lifted the other end. He stood up on the wall to cut the notches and Ma helped roll and hold the log while he settled it where it should be to make the corner perfectly square. So log by log, they built the walls higher till they were pretty high and Laura couldn't get over them any more. I don't think very many of us today build our house by hand, but it's interesting to hear how the pioneers created homes. We're going to have a craft today where we're going to build our own log cabins. So let's get started. For this week's Little House Craft, I thought it would be fun to make a log cabin. Over the years, I've done several different types of log cabins. Some were crafts, a gingerbread log cabin, a log cabin cake, and I'll link to some of those posts down below in the description area. For this log cabin, I can only say I wish that there was smell-o-vision because this cinnamon log cabin smells so good. Now, as you can see, I've placed a flameless votive underneath, so it kind of casts a warm glow, and this would be really pretty on a table. If you made a smaller log cabin, and that would just need smaller cinnamon sticks, you could hang it on a Christmas tree. Um, if you like charcuterie boards, because this is food grade cinnamon, you could even place it over some delicious cheese as a fun little accent piece. So they're really easy to create. Now, when I was a little girl, I used to play with Lincoln Logs, um, and the concept is the same. So you're going to need some cinnamon sticks. I selected cinnamon sticks that were a little bit bigger. You can get some that are smaller, and you can get some that are about double this size. So. Uh, whatever size that you prefer is perfect. And then I um, made my roof just out of some simple paper cardstock. And depending on what size logs that you use, you just cut your paper to fit it. And then if you want to decorate your roof with a wreath, you can get these small wreaths at most craft stores. And for this look, I simply just cut off the little red bow and I added these little cute pine cones and little holly berries. So let's get started. I've already um, started this one just in the essence of time. This particular log cabin, I used just straight white craft glue. So that would be a terrific option if you're crafting with small children. If you're going to use a hot glue gun, make sure it's low temp and absolutely have adult supervision. So we're just gonna add the next layer. So it's just a little dab on the corner and then you take your log, the cinnamon stick, and place it there. 
And then from there, you're going to lay a log straight across. They go together very quickly. If you do use the craft glue, there will be a longer drying time, um, but it really doesn't take that long, about two hours. And when you're putting this together, I like to turn it whenever I'm doing the next row. That way I can kind of line it up so that all of the logs are similar in their placement. This isn't going to be um, a perfect craft because cinnamon sticks are not perfectly straight or round. So just like in nature, um, when the pioneers were creating their log cabin homes, they used logs that were not perfectly circular or smooth. And so you can build it up as high as you want to go. For this one, I did a series of four cinnamon sticks. As you can see, this one has five. So once you get to that place, then you can think about the roof. Now, is your log cabin um, depicted as something in the summer? Well, then a plain roof would be perfect. But if you would like to add a bit of snow, faux snow, um, this is just simple white craft paint that you can get at any craft store. And this is just an old sponge that I've cut up and you kind of dab it in there and take off the excess and then see how it kind of creates an uneven snowfall and look and then you can just go over it and add as little or as much snow as you would like. And so we'll add a little bit more. And this dries very quickly. So then we just simply add a little bit of glue on each of the top corners here and we position our roof in place. I think that looks pretty good. What do you think? And then once the glue is dry, you can add whatever embellishments you would like. So in this instance, after I took off the red bow on this little wreath, I decided that I didn't want red berries. I just wanted the plain pine cones. And this is such a fun decorative item, even for right now in the fall. And just a little bit more glue because this paint, believe it or not, is already dry. And so there is our second little log cap. This week we're going to look at a garment that is similar to a costume worn by the character Carolyn Ingalls on the television show Little House on the Prairie. On the show, both women and girls are often seen wearing sunbonnets and Laura did not like her sunbonnet at all. So in chapter 10, a roof and a floor, she kind of tells us why. Laura's sunbonnet hung down her back. She pulled it up by its strings and its sides came past her cheeks. When her sunbonnet was on, she could only see what was in front of her. And that was why she was always pushing it back and letting it hang by its strings tied around her throat. Now I have some older sunbonnets in my collection that would have been similar to what the pioneers wore. And Laura's correct. With some of them, when I have them on my head, 
I can't see anything on either side, only what's directly in front. And it is kind of difficult. So I understand why she pushed them back. So let's head on over to the corner where I have the costume that is similar to those that Carolyn Ingalls wore on the show. And it does include a sunbonnet. Of all the Little House books, Little House on the Prairie is the most well recognized. And that is in part to the weekly television program that started in 1974. Now the costumes worn by the actors in the series were not 100% historically accurate. The designer of the costumes took elements of the era in which they were portraying and combine them with some modern touches. We use a term for that today called history bounding and that is where you pick out elements that you love. It could be an Edwardian skirt along with a romantic era blouse and combine them to create an outfit that you love wearing in modern day. And so I wanted to create an outfit based on the television series. And my reasoning for that was that many times I attend events uh, for Laura Ingalls Wilder or Little House, and you definitely have a large group that loves the books but you also have two other groups, one which is devoted to the television show and the other, which includes myself, who love both the books and the television show. So I wanted to pay homage to that by creating a costume um, that was similar to what Caroline Ingalls wore in the television series. And I thought it might be fun to take a closer look we can point out what is accurate and what takes more of a history bounding leap. So let's get started. Now, first and foremost, a lot of sunbonnets were worn on the television show. And this, of course, was something that pioneer women, um, even women in the cities, would wear in their everyday life. Um, most of your historical sunbonnets will be gathered in the back through a drawstring. Um, modern productions often use elastic, so it just really depends on how you want to construct your bonnet for modern day history bounding wearing. And a, the second element um, for this particular outfit is I wanted to recreate a blouse that was worn by Carolyn in the series early on. And it was a blouse that featured a shawl collar and a gathered yoke over each shoulder. And this was not actually a style that would have been popular in the 1870s and 1880s. This would have been later in the 20th century, um, but it is still very recognizable to fans. And I'll post a photo so you can kind of compare the blouse that I created um, as to what the actress was wearing in the program. And of course, Ma is often shown wearing her muslin apron, and that is absolutely 100% historically accurate. Um, the half apron was worn by women um, from all walks of life to protect their garments. For the skirt underneath it, 
It's very heavily pleated and it has a metal button closure. I'll take the camera off so we can get a closer look. So you can see that it's heavily pleated on either side, two decorative buttons, and they could have closed their skirts in a wide variety. And there is quite a bit of fullness in the skirt, both in the front and the back. Sorry, my, my girl is old and she's squeaky. I made the pleats a little more widely spaced on the front um, so it wouldn't be as tightly gathered. It's a more slenderizing effect. And this is a lovely costume to wear. There's my Grace, always in the shot. We love her. And it's just um, made from quilting cotton, which you can get at any type of sewing store. I did add on the blouse antique mother of pearl buttons as a nod to the era in which I'm portraying. Today is my son Ian's birthday and we're going to be celebrating with the birthday cake. And in chapter 19, Laura talks about a very special cake that she received. The cakes were too pretty to eat. Mary and Laura just looked at them. But at last, Laura turned hers over and she nibbled a tiny nibble from underneath where it wouldn't show. And inside of that little cake was white. It had been made of pure white flour and sweetened with white sugar. So I thought it would be fun to make a cake that had white flour and white sugar. Pound cake was a cake that was popular in pioneering times and it gets its name because it takes a pound of sugar and a pound of flour and a pound of eggs to create it. So let's head on to the kitchen and make a special birthday cake. This week the kitchen is decorated with festive banners to celebrate my son's birthday. They're made from vintage fabric scraps and help to create a festive atmosphere. The table is dressed with his favorite colors, so I've added green goblets and green napkins. And there are our cinnamon stick log cabins that we made. This week's centerpiece sits in a box that my husband made from reclaimed wood when we replaced our fencing. And I've added a bit of cinnamon to the top of the bouquet. It smells so good. There's a few little acorn sprinkles that I picked up from our yard that are acting as a bit of happy confetti. I've got everything laid out to make our pound cake, so let's get started. Traditional pound cake is very moist and dense. It also keeps very well. It was a recipe that was very popular with pioneers because it was easy to remember. It required a pound of butter, a pound of eggs, a pound of sugar, and a pound of flour. Now since I only need a cake that will serve four people, I've decided to half the recipe. So that requires two sticks of butter, so that'll only be half a pound of butter, four eggs, so that makes half a pound of the egg mixture, two cups of flour, one cup of sugar, a generous pinch of salt, half a teaspoon of vanilla, and half a teaspoon of nutmeg. 
I do use organic ingredients so that the taste is very similar to what the pioneers would have experienced. The process to prepare the pound cake is very easy. In one bowl, you whip the eggs until they are light and frothy. In another bowl, you cream together the butter and the sugar, and then you slowly add in the other dry ingredients, the flour, the salt, and the nutmeg, and then add in your vanilla. Then you'll gently fold in the egg mixture to the creamed butter and flour mixture just until it is barely mixed. You don't want to overmix it because that could create a tough cake. Now since I'm halving the recipe, I'm just going to be using one loaf pan and it will go in an oven for 350 degrees and then I'll turn it down after 30 minutes to 325 degrees and cook it for an additional 30 minutes until a toothpick inserted into the center comes out clean. So I'm going to get started making the batter and then once it's in the oven I'm going to show you how it's going to be dressed and it's delicious. Before I put the cake into the oven, I just wanted to share with you how thick and dense the batter will actually be. And this is why it requires one hour of cooking time. It's just to ensure that even your center is fully cooked. Now, my son doesn't really have a sweet tooth. He um, really loves to have his cakes topped with a German sauce called Rotzgrutz. And so in honor that he was born in Germany, I did make his favorite cake topping. It's very simple. You just take um, any type of red berry. In this case, I used strawberries and raspberries, but I also added in blueberries. The juice of one lemon, and one quarter cup of sugar, and you slowly simmer that on the stove top for about 20 minutes. And then you take two tablespoons of cornstarch, place it in a measuring cup, and add about one quarter cup of water, and mix it until it forms a smooth paste. You then add it to the sauce and allow it to cook for an about additional 20 minutes and it just helps to thicken the, the sauce. The sauce will also thicken a bit more once it cools and you just slice the cake and add the red berry sauce to it. For additional yumminess, I also whipped some old-fashioned whipping cream and that's a trick that I learned that if you have something that you don't want the saran wrap to cling to, just put a little toothpick in the center and then that way it is still kept fresh but it doesn't get uh, mushed down so to speak and so once the cake is cooked and we've sliced it up I will share just how delicious it looks and I wish I had taste of vision because it's really delicious and I hope you'll try the recipe on your own. The Ingalls family moved to Kansas in 1869 and if we think about the changes in our country in the last 150 years, it's truly amazing. Just looking at a map of the United States, Kansas is no longer a frontier, but it sits directly in the middle of a fully settled United States. And Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote about this time long ago in Little House on the Prairie. And she included characters that had racial prejudice 
against Native Americans. She also used words such as Indian, which today should not be used to describe indigenous people. Because of this and other reasons, the book is now banned from many schools and libraries. And this might be a missed opportunity for a teachable moment, one that encourages hard conversations and could possibly further our knowledge and understanding of one another. Because it's important that we learn to be respectful of everyone and treat each other with kindness. There are many examples of devotion to family, loving your neighbor, and the community coming together to help each other in the book. And those are all ideals that our country could really benefit from. At the end of the book, in chapter 24, Laura describes a trail of Native Americans who were moving from east to west as far as her eye could see. This has always been a very difficult passage for me to read. To know that the Native Americans were being driven from land that they had lived on for hundreds of years. And I would hope that we never forget what they endured and strive to be better than this dark time in our nation's history. I encourage you to dig deeper into Little House Perhaps you will be inspired to learn more about Dr. George A. Tan. He was the black physician that treated the Ingalls family for malaria. And Dr. Tan is credited for setting up the first hospital in Oklahoma, as well as many more amazing contributions to our country. He is well, well worth researching. So I hope you'll keep reading and keep learning.